Awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. That was beautiful. So we're going to get started for today. Um, welcome to everyone. It's really uh, great to be here with you today. My name is Nicole Stevenson. I am the director of the Society of Professional Women program with the Mainline Chamber of Commerce. Um, this is our first live virtual event for 2021, so we're super excited about that. We're thrilled to have the world-renowned Jennifer Weiner joining us to kick off our programming today. Um, I've heard from many of you that she is your favorite author, so we are really excited to be able to bring uh, this opportunity to our program today. As always, I'm going to ask for your patience with the technology uh, because, you know, at Zoom. <laughs> so um, I also wanted to let you know that we are aware that it is 2021, but times are still challenging. It was a very challenging year in 2020 for not only the community, but for the world. Um, and so we want to make sure that you know that the Mainline Chamber of Commerce is doing everything that we can to be a resource for this community. And we will continue to focus on the recovery of our region together. So thank you all for your continued support during this time. We appreciate your feedback and all that you're doing to help us to accomplish um, our goals. Uh, SPW would not be possible without, without the support of our members and our sponsors. So I'd like to take this time to acknowledge our sponsors through a video that I'm going to share with you all today. So here we go. I'm Jen Ryan. So I am Jen from Jen and Bill in the Morning here on Philly's B101.1. And B101 is so happy to be a sponsor of the Society for Professional Women. And we want to welcome you to today's event, which could not happen without our sponsors. So I'd like to take a minute right now to thank them. The champion sponsor, Wells Fargo. Communication sponsor, Comcast Business. Employee benefit sponsor, My Benefit Advisor. Women's Health Sponsor, Mainline Health. Diamond Sponsor, B101.1. Women Helping Women Sponsor, Fidelity Investments. And Education Sponsor, St. Joseph's University. And now our Platinum Sponsor, Stradley, Ronan, Stevens, and Young. Hi guys, it's Bill Tafro from the Jen and Bill Show on Philly's B101.1. Thank you so much for listening to us every morning and right now, like to thank the gold sponsors of today's program. 1847 Financial, Closets by Design, Enterprise Holdings and Fleet Management, First Trust Bank, Mainline Today, Montgomery County Community College, MRS Audio Visual, TechWise Group, UGI Amerigas, United Healthcare. Univest Corporation, and Vertex. Silver sponsors, Aqua, an essential utilities company, CSL Bearing, Ernst & Young, The Giant Company, Pico, Pictures by Todd Photography, Seasons 52, Suburban Square, Villanova College of Professional Studies, and WSFS Bank. Awesome, yay, virtual applause. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really important that we talk about our sponsors and all that they bring to the table. They support our mission and our vision, which is to accelerate and expand the influence of women leaders, not only in the workplace, but in government and in our nonprofit sectors. Uh, we also have a huge give back component to our nonprofit community, um, which we are so excited uh, to talk about. I also want to acknowledge that Delaware Valley Friends School and Lincoln Financial Foundation have also stepped up to sponsor today's individual program. Um, all of these companies demonstrate um, a commitment to greater gender equity as well as diversity overall. So we'd really like to give them a round of applause and ask you to support these businesses whenever possible. So thank you so much. The Mainline Chamber of Commerce staff, as I said, is prepared to continue working hard to bring people together for valuable connections and content on multiple fronts. You can visit our website at mlcc.org to sign up for our emails and to stay informed. Our next SPW event is Thursday, February 18th. 
with best-selling author Jacqueline DiGregorio. She will be talking about how to achieve a positive mindset to create growth and success. You can register for all of our events now at spwmainline.com. And you continue to help us serve you by taking our surveys after the event to provide valuable feedback, interacting with us and others on social media using our hashtags, hashtag MLCC and hashtag SPW Mainline. So thank you all for your support. So before I introduce today's esteemed guests, I'd also like to review a few housekeeping items. There is a chat function and a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Remember when it's time for the Q&A at the end of the program to be submitting things to the Q&A box instead of the chat box because they will become lost in the chat unless you're conversing with other people, that's fine. But when it comes for the Q&A time, make sure you're submitting that to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. In order to continue to connect individuals with one another um, during today's program, we'll send the attendee list after the event and we will provide you instructions on how to connect with one another and we will try to make as many introductions as we can for you all to have conversations with one another. And we're also hosting breakout sessions at the end of the program. So there will be a moderator in each room to direct those conversations. So thank you to our volunteers for helping with that today. And each attendee will have the opportunity to introduce themselves as well and their company, and then lead the discussion through a proposed question from today's program to engage in that dialogue between everyone. The link for the meeting rooms can be found in the chat box now. You can save it now uh, so that you can use it at the end of the program, but it will be provided again at the end of the program. We ask that you be patient during this transfer. We will have a mainline chamber of commerce staff member in that room to greet you before I get there, but I wanna make sure everyone gets over, so just be patient. Um, so now let's get started. I'd like to welcome and thank Cheldon Barlett Rumor for being our interview host today. Sheldon is an important supporter of SPW. The program has been featured on her digital TV network, This Is It TV, many times. She has spoken for a trademark event herself, and she's also participated as an expert facilitator in our Women Helping Women mentoring group. So she's a, a really appreciative of your time and your support, Sheldon, for today. And also, we want to welcome and thank, of course, our highly anticipated guest, uh, best-selling author Jennifer Weiner, uh, for your flexibility with working with me to bring an engaging presentation virtually to our community. So thank you both for being here. Um, as you know, I've mentioned giving back to nonprofits. Nonprofit communities are a big part of the SPW mission. And in just over a decade, SPW has awarded over $80,000 to our local nonprofits. So we are really thrilled to announce that in addition to being our communication sponsor, Comcast Business has joined us as our community giving sponsor and will be giving $1,000 to our nonprofit today. With the restaurant industry being hit very hard during this pandemic and the continued challenges that they're facing, Cooks Who Care was the perfect nonprofit to feature for our first event today. So I'd like to thank co-founder Maria Campbell for being with us to share more about their important work. At SPW, we're proud to partner with so many companies that live our mission and our vision and Comcast Business is one of those partners. So it's now my pleasure to introduce SMB Sales Director Barry Levin to today's program and introduce our nonprofit today. Barry. Thanks, Nicole. Um, and good, after, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Barry Levin, as Nicole said, and I'm the Regional Sales Director for Comcast Business in, here in the greater Philadelphia area. Uh, Comcast Business is proud to be the official communication sponsor for SPW. Bear with me here, I'm getting situated with technology. For SPW, once again in 2021, we are extremely grateful for this opportunity and for the ability to speak to you all here today. At Comcast Business, we provide advanced communication solutions that allow our business customers to stay connected, um, connected to the internet, to data centers, to customers, to suppliers, and to a remote workforce. So when connectivity matters, you can count on us. If you have any business needs, please don't hesitate to reach out as we have had great success helping SPW members with their business needs. Comcast Business's mission throughout these recent challenging times has been to not only help businesses bounce back, but bounce forward. Through our partnership with SPW, we have been truly able to connect with the local community through their events, networking, and overall engagement. And while our partnership has been long and fruitful for the past eight years, we wanted to do even more to support the Mainline Chamber and SPW community in 2021. That is why we are thrilled to further our collective mission by giving back to a few very deserving nonprofit organizations this year. 
and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our very first here today. Today we will hear from Lee Maxwell, co-founder. I, yeah, Nicole, I see you. this is the one you sent me. Okay, I'm so <laughs> sorry. Let me. I'm I'm pulling up my script now to see what might have happened. Um, yeah, that's I shot you a text. I'm like, this isn't. <laughs> I'm getting into it. I'm so sorry, I'm looking. So sorry, everyone, and sorry to Barry. That's all right. The, the intro to see what might have happened. Oh, here it is. Um, so I'm going to slide this right to you. Fantastic. In the chat. See everyone, this is this is real life, right? <laughs> Live virtual events and trying to figure out what's going on and um, copying and pasting this for you in the chat. Thank you. I was trying to do it before we got to this point, but you know that's okay. Sorry, right. I was talking. I talked a little fast. Sorry. <laughs> You're a professional. You got this. I sent. All right. Perfect. So back to business, shall we? All right. The featured nonprofit today is Cooks Who Care a Philly-based organization that supports the well-being of people working in all facets of the food and beverage industry. Founded by chefs Maria and Scott Campbell, Cooks Who Care is dedicated to building a community that supports employers and employees as they strive to prioritize physical, mental, and financial health both on and off the job. Donated funds during COVID-19 have and continue to be used to hire freelance workers out of work to help research pandemic help research pandemic resources for employers and employees and help create a toolkit post COVID to design a new landscape for the food and beverage industry. The Comcast business, it is our shared commitment to support and give back to local organizations like yours that are making a difference. In appreciation for all you do, it is my honor to present you with this $1,000 check from Comcast business. Oh no, I lost my notes now. <laughs> It is, I'm so sorry. Uh, this $1,000 check from Comcast Business. Please welcome founder Maria Campbell to share more about their amazing work. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Barry, so much. Um, you know, as a chef by trade, food stands as a source of strength, right? Making ends meet in this environment is a struggle daily. And yet our industry in the food and beverage sector is the first to pass a meal to someone else because it's ingrained to serve others and take last. Um, when we do our 100% committed campaigns, which we do monthly delivering 100 meals to Philadelphia communities in our area, and I do it in my car with one other person, um, we do it to show that we are 100% committed to our community. We've converted our messaging to resound a statement worthy of a gift they deserve, receive a morale boost. I've seen welling eyes, I've seen tears, I've seen moments of guilt for even doing well as a business operator, and I've seen smiles and givers and gratitude of people telling me they can't remember the last time somebody bought them a meal. Um, we're all challenged in this time, but we want to emphasize the importance of unity and show kindness as a community who's ashamed to reveal their hardship and demoralized by being down on their luck. Um, by sharing these resources and contributing in this way, we're able to continue our monthly program by doing this once a month. And so far, we've delivered to 42 locations in September. We've done five meal campaigns and collaborated with six locations and delivered over 530 meals. Um, I'm a big believer of it doesn't take a lot to do so much. And this really helps us to continue the great work and to show that we care about our community. Um, we are encouraging the discouraged one meal at a time. We will continue our GoFundMe campaign we have an IGTV channel that we host weekly. We're doing one today as well, uh, which is special to uplift unheard voices. And I'm so grateful uh, for this recognition and this contribution to continue our work in our community. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you who I have not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Lauren Papari, and I am a senior account executive with My Benefit Advisor, and we are the Chamber's endorsed employee benefits consultant and insurance partner for over 30 years. I also have 
the very much a privilege to work with Maria and her organization as a client, as their benefits partner as well. And I just want to fully say, check out what she's doing because she is really creating a movement for her industry. It's really been um, just unbelievable to see her organization unfold in the past year. The MBA program continues to guide employers through the complexity of planning, communicating, and managing employee benefits. 2020 brought about financial, employment, and healthcare challenges that were unprecedented with unimaginable impact. It is only with the support and quick pivot of the mainline chamber to an incredibly effective 100% virtual environment that our relationship continues to grow. The Chamber and SPW's commitment to creating valuable programming and networking has enabled my benefit advisor to continue to reach and help employers manage their health care, their insurance, their human resources, and employee benefits challenges through a, through a truly chaotic and unpredictable time. I saw a great anonymous quote last week which read, while we cannot undo what is done, we can see it, understand it, learn from it, and change so that every new moment is spent not in regret, guilt, fear, or anger, but in wisdom, understanding, and love. Thank you to the Chamber and the Society of Professional Women for always providing an environment of fresh perspective and support with which we can shift our mindset, grow, and change. I am honored to be here today introducing our guests. Please join me in welcoming our host interviewer and featured speaker to today's program. Our interviewer, Sheldon Barlett Rumor, is the CEO of IG Creative and the executive producer and host of This Is It TV. She has developed a digital hands-on educational tool that has been designed specifically to support the needs of small business owners, entrepreneurs, and independent sales professionals who are looking to take their marketing efforts to the next level while achieving their realistic and measurable ongoing business goals. As a working mom of two wonderful children, Cheldon wants to inspire female entrepreneurs to no longer whisper their wishes, but scream their dream. She is also an adjunct professor at Temple University in Philadelphia, where she instructs undergraduate students in the art of professional branding, as well as interactive media and advertising. Our esteemed guest being interviewed today is number one New York Times bestselling author, Jennifer Weiner. Jennifer's books have spent over five years on the New York Times bestseller list with over 11 million copies in print in 36 countries. Her newest novel, Mrs. Everything, debuted on June 11th, 2019, and is a smart, thoughtful, and timely exploration of two sisters' lives from the 1950s to the present as they struggle to find their places and be true to themselves in a rapidly evolving world. Mrs. Everything is an ambitious, richly textured journey through history and herstory. As these two sisters navigate a changing America over the course of their lives. In addition to the novel, Mrs. Everything, Jennifer is the author of the novels, Good in Bed, In Her Shoes, which was turned into a major motion picture starring Cameron Diaz, Tony Collette, and Shirley MacLaine, Little Earthquakes, Good Night Nobody, the short story collection, The Guy Not Taken, Certain Girls, Best Friends Forever, Fly Away Home, Then Came You, The Next Best Thing, All Fall Down, and Who Do You Love? She is also the author of The Littlest Bigfoot, the first in a trilogy of middle grade novels and the nonfiction collection, Hungry Heart, Adventures in Life, Love, and Writing. A graduate of Princeton University and a contributor to the New York Times opinion section, Jennifer lives with her family in Philadelphia. Please welcome Cheldon and Jennifer to have a conversation with us. Hello, everyone. I mean, is everyone so excited? I can't even stand it. It's so exciting. I'm so excited to be here with you. Hello, Jennifer. So nice to meet you. Hello, Cheldon. It's great to be here. Um, I was telling the ladies before, I'm, I'm very grateful to have an excuse to put on an actual bra. So, <laughs> and makeup. Very happy. Exactly, exactly. So for all of you out there, I mean, we've looked forward to this. I hope that all of you have looked forward to this as well, whether you are bra-less 
or you have come bearing a bra and lashes and hair and makeup, we are happy to see you nonetheless. I'm so excited for this because this is gonna be a conversation, if you don't mind, where I can become your friend and have a better understanding as to how it all began and the impact that you're looking to make and then where it's all going. So I'd love to get started if that's okay with you. Yes, let's okay. do it. This is wonderful. So. I mean, it has been a journey, um, my friend, and it has been one that hasn't happened overnight. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. But I want to be able to have an understanding um, of your journey. I understand that you've always wanted to be a writer, but there was a few other goals and objectives there in between. I think a ballerina was something that you were aspiring to at one point. Um, um, I, I joke that that dream died a very hard death, um, but, it, but it did die. And I mean, honestly, this was the only thing I ever wanted to do with my life. It was sort of the only thing I was ever really good at. And I can remember being in first grade and my teacher would let me stay in from recess, which was a big treat for me. And she'd give me extra paper and she'd let me just sit and write stories. So even back then, I mean, I loved to read. I, um, I had this like gigantic vocabulary and no friends. And like those two things combined made me a reader and eventually a writer. So I read my whole childhood. I went to college. I was an English major because that's obviously the major where you get to read all of the books. I graduated in 1991. Um, for those of you old enough to remember, there was a recession in 1991. And my parents had made it really clear to me that I needed to get a J-O-B. So I was, you know, I knew that I wanted to write fiction. Like that was the dream, but it's really hard to get hired as a novelist. Like you, nobody's gonna pay you to sit around for a year and write a novel. So I went to my parents and I said, would either of you be interested in becoming a patron of the arts and supporting me for a while? And they're both like, no, no. They, they were divorced very um, angrily by then. I think it was the first thing they had agreed on in a long, long time that they were not going to support me while I did this. And so I had two choices. I, it's, as far as I could see, I could either, um, you know, the jobs where you get paid to write, I figured it was either gonna be journalism or advertising. And for some reason, I was just convinced that if I went into advertising, I would end up on the Tampax campaign and my entire professional life would be involved. You know, I'd have to think up synonyms for the word absorbent. And there's not that many, you know, so um, we'll, we can come back to that because there is a funny, it, it all comes back around. So anyhow, I, I get a job at a small newspaper in central Pennsylvania, the Center Daily Times, for any of you who went to Penn State, that was my, my first job out of college. Um, one of the things that I had to do was type in the school lunch menus every Monday for five school districts. And let me tell you, I, I had taken a creative writing class with Toni Morrison, right? I thought I was the business, okay? And I get to this job and I'm sitting at my desk and I'm typing hot dog in bun with choice of chocolate or plain milk. And I'm like, what happened? <laughs> what what <does> that happened? <laughs> so small paper, medium paper. Eventually I end up at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Very happy, very pleased. I had been in Lexington, Kentucky. I was you know, it was a nice place to spend a couple months. And then I was like, okay, you know, I've dated both of the Jews here. I need to go. And I end up in Philadelphia. I meet a nice Jewish boy. I am dating him and I'm 26 and I'm 27. I'm 28. I'm feeling the eggs getting older. And I'm like, so, you know, we, are we putting a ring on it or what? And we're not. And, you know, he's like, just not ready, not interested, not happening. And, and he starts dating somebody else. And my, my poor heart was broken. And I'm after, after six months of really pathetic wallowing and singing, my heart will go on because this was the year, of course, the Titanic came out that I get my heart broken. I'm like, okay, I am going to write a novel. I'm going to write a novel where the girl is a lot like me and the guy is a lot like Satan and I am going to give the girl a happy ending. And, you know, so like I'm working nights and weekends, um, you know, I'm a reporter by day and I'm like working on this book in all of my free time, which I have a lot of because I have no boyfriend anymore and I have no social life. And, you know, 
I found an agent, I found a publisher, and the book came out in 2001, and I was off to the races. Oh my goodness. Now, what I love about, there's so much that I love, let's be honest, <laughs> about that story. I mean, a lot about the story. We'll talk about the tampons soon enough. But yeah. all of that, all of that is to say, I know that there's a lot of people that are listening, whether it be on this Zoom or who will listen in the future, that are feeling you know, discouraged in their journey, thinking that it's a straight line, thinking that, you know, if you dream it, you will be it and it will be this version of this overnight success. But what I love about the authenticity of what you shared with us was that it wasn't a direct line, that yeah. you knew what you wanted, um, but how to get there is is where the real journey lives, right? And, and am I fair yeah. in you know, and the thing is, the idea of like, I'm going to write a novel when I'm 21 or 22, it's like, well, what are you going to write your novel about? Nothing's happened to you. And if I could go back in time and like talk to that 21 year old version of myself who would like see people her age, like getting hired to write for Saturday Night Live and just think, oh my God, like it's never going to happen. I'm going to die at this newspaper and I'm, I'm always going to be like the school lunch lady typist you know things take time and and wisdom takes time and having those experiences living different places meeting different people writing a million stories um because when you work for a small newspaper you're writing every day you're writing you know if a business opens you're covering that if the school board meets you're covering that if there's a house fire you're covering that and i was writing and writing and writing and i'm sure all of you guys know that 10,000 hour theory of things that you need to do something for 10,000 hours to achieve mastery well by the time I wrote my first book, I'd been a newspaper reporter for nine years and I added it up and it was really, it was right around 10,000 hours. So, you know, I, I would urge patience and yeah. I think, you know, there's, there's something to be said for letting things unfold as they will. And, you know, for, for just realizing that, um, Sometimes when a door closes, a window opens and there's, you know, maybe the opportunity that you thought that you wanted, that you thought was so perfect, isn't the thing that was supposed to happen for you, but something else that's around the corner is. Oh, I absolutely love that. For those of you that are listening, it's time for you to look for the window and stop banging on that door. And I love that. And I think it's such a necessary message to share, especially in these challenging times where people are looking for opportunities and, and getting discouraged. At least we have a friend here to show us the way. I want to be able to dive into the inspiration because the, the heartbreak was the initial inspiration, let's say, but there's been a lot of projects between that heartbreak and now. Yes. Where yeah, where do you find your inspiration for all of the creations? Because you can't go getting dumped like that every six months. It's just not good. Um, you know, like, so I, I wrote my first novel and I signed a two book deal. So that was that novel. And then it was like, okay, what are you going to do next? And what I decided to do next was I sort of looked at my life and it's like, okay, you know, what are the stories that I want to tell? Who are the characters? who I want readers to meet? What are the messages that I wanna to send to people? My second book was a story about sisters because I have a sister, she's 15 months younger than I am. We could not be any more different, um, you know, but we love each other and we have this, you know, deep abiding bond that you, you only have with somebody who saw you at the lowest points of your fashion life. You know, somebody who saw that perm in 1987 and can, has pictures. Um, and, and I think for, for me, at least, inspiration is a matter of just paying a lot of attention to the world and, um, and lots of eavesdropping too, honestly, like when you're in the park or when you're at the little gym or when you're in a restaurant, when we can go to restaurants again or the coffee shop or the yoga class, you will hear the most amazing stuff. And, and I think I, the most valuable question I think a writer can ask herself is what if, okay? So like, what if I could give this a different ending? What if I could put those two people together? What if she'd married somebody completely different? Or what if I'd had a different kind of kid? You know, all of those what ifs are what form the, the tissue of my, my fiction. Um, and then in terms of columns, which I also love writing, it's sort of like, if there is something that is happening in the world and I have something to say about it, I'm really, really fortunate to be able to have an editor where I can just be like, 
like, oh my God, did you see that? I need to write about it. And here's 800 words. Oh, I absolutely love all of this. I hope all of you are as well. There is a question answer section. So we'll be getting to that a little bit later if things are, begin to come to you and you wanna start asking my new friend some questions. I absolutely you know, also love finding the inspiration within it sound and the stillness. I mean, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people move so quickly and they're looking to be inspired. They're looking to find it, um, mm -hmm. kind of like a treasure hunt as opposed to being still and observing it. Do you find in those eavesdropping conversations or, you know, in the uh, observations of life, do you find those observ those inspirations? Uh, definitely. I mean, I think like learning to listen is really a skill and, and not just sort of waiting for your turn to say something, but really like, you know, that, that stillness that you mentioned. And for me, I get a lot of my inspiration like in the shower, obviously, and it's very hard to take notes there, I can tell you. Um, but also with exercise, like I think there's something, I ride my bike a lot, I walk, cause I live in center city, so I walk everywhere. And there's something about that repetitive motion. It's almost like, a, I've read it described as a form of self-hypnosis where you're putting your mind into this state where you're going to be receptive to inspiration. So anybody, you know, people ask me like, what do I do about writer's block? And I'm lucky enough not to really suffer from it. But if I ever get stuck, if I ever like hit a point in a book where it's like, I don't know what happens next, or I don't know where to take this character, or I don't know what this person's motivation might have been, I go for a walk. You know, I, I hitch up my little dog and I take her out and off we go. And a couple of miles later, you know, I either have an answer or a blister. That's fair. <laughs> but all of, all, of, all of it is worth it, whether it be the blister or the answer. And I think that this is all, I hope you guys are sucking all of this in because it's such good, uh, such good advice um, from such an authentic space to encourage us all to find, be still, to find the inspiration in what it is that we've got going on. I wanna talk about your journey. I know that you went to Princeton um, and you know I'm gonna marry the two, these strong feminine characters that you have brought to life for all of us um, and these strong leads. Um, um, you were a strong lead. You were a strong feminine female character in your own life. Um, I know that at Princeton, you've made some moves. You had made some moves to make some change yeah. um, to encourage equality. So when I started at Princeton, Princeton doesn't have fraternities and sororities the way most normal places do. It has eating clubs, which um, it's basically there. I know it sounds amazing. I, when I heard that, I'm like, I'm going there. And then people explain to me, no, 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 it's not like, a, you know, it's just where you eat your food. It's not, it's like a fraternity or a sorority where you don't spend the night. It's just where upperclassmen go to eat. Okay. And when I started at Princeton, there were, um, I think there were 13 eating clubs and three of, no, not three, two of them were all male. Now, Princeton had accepted women. It was the last of the Ivies, I think, to do it. Um, 20 years before I got there was when they finally, finally, finally said, okay, girls, you can come on in. Um, I remember I was, in a, I was in an all girls dorm, which was lovely. Like my room had a fireplace. It was the nicest place I write. I know it was, I, it was the nicest place I would live for the next 10 years. Um, but in the bathrooms, there was like, you know, the wall of urinals that they hadn't bothered to get rid of because I don't know, maybe they thought we wouldn't be staying very long. Um, you know, so there I am and I am thinking to myself, you know, um, I'm paying the same tuition as these guys. I am taking the same classes. I am working just as hard. Why is it fair that they have more outlets available to them? Because the eating clubs, in addition to being places where you ate, they were also places where you networked. And I don't think I have to tell anybody who's listening the importance of networking, of making those connections, of forming those bonds that are going to sort of sustain you as you go through your career, as you're building a business. Um, you know, the idea that women weren't welcome in these spaces just didn't sit right with me. And, you know, these clubs had been all male forever. They had very strong traditions. They were very adamant about the idea that they had a legal right to maintain these separate spaces. 
And I was sort of making the case, you know, and, and other people were at the same time, but I was just one of the organizers that, okay, you've got the right to do this, but is it really fair? You know, is this really the Princeton that we should have in 1990, 1991? And um, through a lot of debating and demonstrating and writing op-eds and carrying signs and chanting, eventually both of the clubs that were all male voted to accept women. Um, the year I graduated, they both bickered. That's the, that's what they call rush. It's bicker. They both bickered their first class of women. And I, you know, that was a real achievement. That was something I felt really good about. And, you know, I was raised with a very strong feminist mom and you know, and a lot of strong Jewish values too. And, and one of those values is the idea that like, when you see injustice, you say something and you always want to leave the world better than it was when you found it. And so that's something that's motivated me my, my whole life. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, I know that Princeton is better for it. And I know that the efforts were probably not easy, um, just in an assumption to get that, to make that change happen. What I also heard is that, again, it started with a question. It started with stillness. It started with yeah. observing, you know, the urinals literally and saying that there's something, there's something off here. And where can I find that answer? How do you think, you know, as we battle you know, the trials and tribulations of our current situation in the feminist movement, mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you think that has changed since 1991, you know, in that space? Has it changed at all? I would love to get your insight on you that. Know, I, I think the, the statement that I come back to a lot is the, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard it or possibly seen the t-shirt, is that feminism is the radical notion that women are people. And I think when you start from that place and it really can open your eyes to all of the ways that women are still not quite entirely seen as people the way that men are. I mean, I was reading recently a, a, a story about um, the COVID vaccine trials and how everything was predicated on normal but normal was a man. Normal was, you know, a six foot tall, 175 pound man. Well, you know, that's not everybody's normal, but for such a long time in the medical science research community, you know, that's normal. And I, I think, you know, just the idea that um, women should be welcome everywhere, our, our voices should be raised up the same way that men's voices are raised up. Um, and I think that there's certainly been progress since I was in college. I mean, you know, I, I think the handful of women who we saw as elected officials is now a larger handful. Um, I think that white feminists have certainly become much more aware of our own blind spots and our own biases and have looked to become more inclusive, more embracing and, and looked at the ways that our privilege is impacting other people who don't have the same privileges. Um, and, you know, I think becoming a mother too was, was huge. I have two daughters, um, they drive me crazy. <laughs> I mean, I think the children are only here to do that. Right. You know, just, just as I, I'm sure, drove my mom crazy. I have a 17-year-old who is like, you know, she, she thinks I am just like the most embarrassing thing to ever have existed or drawn breath. And, you know, and, and like, and then I have a 13-year-old and the two of them are so much more like evolved than I ever was. I mean, like, I remember a couple of months ago saying something about Columbus Day and boy, did they jump all over like, mom, Columbus was a colonizer, don't you know? And we don't talk about that anymore. And it's like, you know, okay, well explain it to me. And, and they will, I mean, and, and I think that like, you know, it's, it's every generation's job to move that ball forward. And I think like, as much as I have been able to do and hopefully will continue to be able to do, like I look at the two of them and I have tremendous, tremendous hope for the future. Oh, and as do I, and as do I. And I know that one of the interesting things about them and their willingness to participate 
in conversations. And I think I'm an avid, obviously, communicator and, and a big fan of even having difficult conversations, whether it be about what's going on in the world or whether it be about myself. And I know that you gain a lot, gained a lot of traction from um, a hashtag, my friend, mm -hmm. that you decided to share wear mm -hmm. the swimsuit. Yes, um, yes, yes planning on being and just to give context i would love for you to share the nature of that and if you were planning on being a body positivity activist in addition to all the other work that you were doing or was it just about a statement to say just wear the suit ladies just put it on well i i don't know that anybody ever sets out to go viral i mean i you know it's it, it would be great if we could wave a magic wand and make that happen or equally wave a magic wand and have it not happen as the case may be but what happened with me was this um i was looking at pictures and i was looking at pictures of my older daughter's like infancy and i was noticing that basically there were pictures of me in the hospital giving birth to her there were pictures of me at her first birthday party. And in the year between, it was like I had ceased to exist. Like I might as well have been like raptured or something. I just was not there. And my daughter was like, you know, mom, like what what, what was going on here? And I was like, oh, you know, I, I was the one who took the pictures. And, you know, remember not everybody had iPhones back then, you know, in the day when we had to walk five miles to get to school and it was uphill both ways and it was always snowing. And, and she's like, well, well, yeah, but you know, like there, there were cameras, right? And I had to admit that there were in fact cameras and I had to like come clean with her basically was the reason I wasn't in any pictures was I felt like crap about myself. And I felt like I didn't deserve to be in the picture. I was always, always like trying to hide behind, you know, like when the camera came out, I was like, okay, where can I, where can I hide? Where can I go? Like, you know, do I have a cover up? Is there a tree? Is there a boulder? Is there a school bus? You know? And, and then I was like, what kind of message is this sending? Like, what am I telling my daughters? Yeah. Like, I don't ever want them to believe that life has a sign that says you must weigh less than this number to get on the ride and enjoy it. And so I had just ordered this cute little swimsuit from Macy's, um, you know, and so I like, I put it on and I put on my little wedges and I like take my size 16 self up on the roof and my husband takes my picture and I post it. And I write this little thing about like realizing that I wasn't in any of these pictures and I was not ever like, I wasn't going in the water, not where anybody could see me. I just didn't, you know, and, and how much did I miss by being so worried and, and right. And like, not just being in the pictures, but like being with my kids, being present in the moment. And it kind of broke my heart. And, and I, I was thinking about like, all of the women who are missing out on those moments and the pleasure of like just being in the water with your kids because you don't think that you look the way you want to look or that it's acceptable for you to be in a bathing suit. And so I took the picture and I hashtagged it, wear the swimsuit. And it kind of took off because I think, and what happened was a lot of women who were following me on Facebook posted their own pictures. And, and and I just sort of said to myself, like, if I can get one mom to yeah. take off her cover up and go in the water with her kid, like this will have been worth it. And I don't even care if everyone in the world can see my cellulite. And a lot of women ended up writing to me and saying, thank you for putting yourself out there. Thank you, thank you for giving me this reminder. You know, I went to the beach with my son or with my daughter and, and that just, you know, that was one of those moments where like, you really feel like you're doing what you were put on the world to do. Right. And utilizing the platforms that are available for really some good. And, and when you, you ask if it's worth it, it was, and it, and it really took off in a way that created conversation, allowed for people to celebrate who it is that they are, because you were so right about the way in which when you're focused on covering up, you're not focused on everything else, right? If the, the, the energy that you're using to kind of hide, you can right. be using to enjoy yourself or to actually be part 
of the experience. Exactly. And so let's continue the experience of being a mother because mm -hmm. according to Twitter, you are the top 25 moms to follow on Twitter. Um, <laughs> you know, you're hitting every single social media platform and we are all better for it. You know, as we are career women, you know, whether or not you, you have children or you, not, you don't, the balance between family and your business or career, um, there need, we need to seek out some balance. And I know we've heard a number of different answers as it relates to this question, but I would love for you to share your version of work-life balance with us. Oh, I mean, that is, it's, it's such a great question. I wish I had an answer. I wish I had a one size fits all answer, you know? And the thing that I talk about a lot is just the idea of like the guilt that we as women feel because you feel like you should be there for your kids. You should be taking care of your house. You know, the kitchen should be clean and the laundry should be folded. There should be dinner on the table and you should be doing like a standout job at work. And it's like, well, how do you do it all? And, and how do you forgive yourself if you're not? And how do you ask for help? And I think that is such a huge question for so many women because, you know, it's like, oh no, I'm fine. I got this. I got, don't worry. I can handle it. You know, just no, I, and, and you never want to say that you're struggling yeah. or that you need more time or that you need more help or whatever it is you need. Like, we're just not taught to use that. We're not taught to like exercise that muscle of opening our mouths and saying, I need some help. And, you know, I talk to people about this all the time. And the other thing that I do, um, I try to be really honest about all of the help that I have. Like when my kids were little and people would say to me, like, how do you do it? How do you possibly write books with little kids? I'm like, I got a nanny. That's, that's how I do it. I got a nanny, right? Like I got, I got a housekeeper too. And, and, you know, but I think that we see these pictures of celebrities or these days we see them on Instagram, we see them on TikTok and like, cognitively, you know, there's got to be a nanny there somewhere. Okay. Like Angelina Jolie is not like taking care of all eight of those children herself and, and, and having them look that good. Like there's got to be some help, but if you're not seeing it, if you're not processing, you know, if you don't have like the visual evidence, you're like, oh no, she's just really got it all together. And I really don't, you know, and then the guilt comes. Um, I, I think that, you know, the more honest and open we can be about what it's really, what's really allowing us to flourish and what is sort of, you know, what are the trade-offs? Because there are real trade-offs. I mean, and, and I will tell you that like, you know, did I write my, you know, five pages yesterday? Yes, I did. Are there two baskets of unfolded laundry sitting on my bedroom floor? Yes, there are, you know, and, and just, you got to decide what you can make peace with what's going to drive you crazy. Like I cannot handle an unmade bed, but I can handle dirty dishes as long as they're in the sink where I can't see them, you know? So just like figure it out and, and figure out how to forgive yourself like that. The older I get, the longer I live, the more I know how important that piece of it is. Just like, don't hold yourself to such a high level that you're never, ever, ever going to succeed. Yeah. And the, I think that what, at least what I've benefited from, from that answer, and I hope that everyone who's listening has benefited from as well, is about really being honest with yourself, right? And prioritizing what is going on in your life and being kind to yourself as you do it to get the things done that you need to get done in that way. And then, you know, I, I it, it is a diff difficult thing for especially entrepreneurial minded, career driven, driven individuals in general to say that they can't do something, right? Like that's always a problem. I My big thing for me is if I say I'm fine three times, I'm not fine. If I'm like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Like you need to call for help because Sheldon mm -hmm. is not fine. Right. Um, and and so those are those kind of triggers that we can kind of manage. But we have some questions um, that I would love from our from our wonderful, wonderful audience here. Thank you so much uh, for those initial answers. I'm so excited. You're stuck with me. We're best friends now. I don't know if you knew that, but that's what's going to be the case. Um, I wanted to ask you um, a question from the Q&A. This is actually from Jennifer Robinson. Oh, so wonderful. Um, what have you not tackled yet? 
uh, would love to do? What have you not tackled? Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you for that. Uh, so, I mean, I guess there's like the personal answer. There's the professional answer. Um, I've never adapted one of my books. Um, when In Her Shoes was made into a movie, like I had a very wise friend who said, a novelist trying to adapt her own work is like a mother trying to circumcise her own child. Like let someone else do the cutting, right? And I was like, you know what? Like, that is really smart. And I will, I will let somebody else do it. But, you know, I always wonder, I mean, maybe the thing I should do instead of like trying to adapt something is like writing something original because then I won't have to cut anything. I can just like tell the story. But, um, you know, so I would say that's a professional goal. Um, personally, I, I would like to ride my bike a hundred miles. I would like to do a century. I've, I've gotten up to like 80, you know, and then it's, yeah, no, seriously. But then it's like, you know, something happens or then it's winter or whatever, but I would like to do a century. Then in you're in the state. One. Like, yeah. So hold me to that people come find me on social media. See how I'm doing. <laughs> We've heard her. She's put it out into the world. We're going to see if she can make it happen. I know you can. There is really very little that you've tackled that you haven't been able to do. So I think that that's absolutely wonderful. The next one is, I mean, and this is a selfish question for me as well. How do you suggest that women raise their voices to create equity in their workplace? I mean, in the reality of it, um, you know, how do you suggest that they do so? Wow, I mean, that is a really good question. And I think, I, I hope that right now is a moment where there's gonna be some receptivity to it. Like, I think that if there's an upside to all of the upheaval and all of the drama, I, I think that in the business world, in, in the world in general, people are doing soul searching, right? Like people are, you know, doing some, doing their introspective thing and, and trying to say like, okay, how am I a part of the problem? How can I move to be a part of the solution? And I think you just gotta like speak your truth, right? And you don't have to be rude. You don't have to be pushy, but you can be persistent and you can be firm. And, you know, I, I think that like, um, it's, it's just a matter of practicing sometimes. Like it's hard, okay? Like it's hard to ask for a raise. And, and I decided when I was very young, like, every time I have an opportunity to do so, I'm going to ask for more money because like, what can they say to me? They can say no, but they can't like, they're not going to fire me just for asking. And so, you know, I'm like, I am going to like work on that muscle until it just becomes like a reflexive thing. And, and so I think you just, you work on that muscle. And if you've got to like, if you're seeing something in your place of business or in your organization, I think like, you know, for me, writing it out first, like, okay, here's what I've, here's what I've noticed. Here's what I've seen, you know, give some evidence and, and here's a proposed solution. And, and then you can sort of make it collaborative. You can say like, look, I'm sure this matters a lot to you too, hint, hint, and you want to fix this too. Am I right? And let's work together, you know, like invite people to be part of your team. People want to collaborate. And I, I have to believe that at least right now, a lot of people are looking to do better. Oh, I love that. I hope a lot of people are looking to do better. I have one more question before um, we move on in the event. I could talk to you for days and plan <laughs> on getting a call. Okay, so the next one, I think that one of the stories that really resonated with our audience, definitely resonated with me, was the literal example that you gave about writing the menus for the newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that there are folks out there that are not in their ideal job that have their dream, that know what they are good at, but don't find themselves actually, you know, executing upon that goodness on their day to day. How do you think people should gain that success or move towards that success and those opportunities, even if they're doing something that isn't their ideal dream or truth? Yeah, I mean, I think that for me, it was like, you know, here I am in this job where there's a lot of this kind of like rote, busy work. And I know this isn't what I want to really be doing with my life. Um, part of it was just a mindset thing. You know, it was like, okay, this is not living the creative dream, but 
it's got to be good for something, right? And and so, you know, maybe it's going to be good for like my accuracy. Maybe it's going to be good because every week I've got to talk to the person at the school district who's giving me the school lunches. So maybe that person's going to be a source someday, right? Maybe she's going to call me up and say, hey, guess what? You know, this amazing thing is happening in our school. And I wanted you to be the first to know because you're so nice to me and you always spell applesauce as two words, not one. Um, you know, look for those opportunities. And, and then I would say like, make your own, because that was the other thing that I was doing. Even when I had this like crappy, crappy, crappy newspaper job, and I was making $16,000 a year, which was not a lot, wow. you know, I would come home at nights and on the weekend, and I would write short stories and I would submit them to magazines and I would get rejection letters and I would like paper my walls with them. And, you know, usually they were just like form letters, but every once in a while I would get like a, a handwritten sentence that would say something like, you're clearly a writer, but this isn't right for us. And I would, you know, I would be like, oh my God, like I'm clearly a writer. Do you see that? Somebody at the Atlantic says I'm clearly a writer. Um, and the other thing for women, especially, like I, I talk about this all of the time. A lot of times when you're a writer and you submit something, the rejection letter will say, this isn't right for us, but please submit again. And I always joke that the women I know hear the, this isn't right for us piece. And the men hear the, please submit again, and immediately start sending out, you know, oh, here's five more stories that I wrote. And the women are like, I suck. I'm never going to be able to do this. I, I think, wow. you know, if, if you're getting opportunities, if they're saying submit to us again, submit to them again. Like, what do you have to lose? What you know? lose we have lost nothing with our time with you i am obsessed i know that everybody who's listening is jotting down notes following you even more so nicole was that not amazing <laughs> amazing couldn't be more happy <laughs> it was Thank you so much jennifer for your time you have spoiled me in this hour of my life that i'll remember so much thank you so much Thank you guys for having me. And you can find me on social media. I'm at Jennifer Weiner on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm Jennifer Weiner writes on Instagram. God help me. I'm on TikTok. I'm not doing dances, but I'm there. So come find me. And I'm always happy to answer questions or anything you need to know about writing or, or life in general. I am there for you.